So in this short video, we're going to see how we can use Green's theorem to calculate the area of a region using a line integral. So we recall that we could use a double integral to calculate the area if we just use the double integral over the region with one as the integrand. Well, Green's theorem says that the line integral over the boundary of that region is going to be the same as the double integral of partial of q with respect to x minus partial of p with respect to y. So we'd have to have some f defined with component functions p and q. Well, if I could choose, so this time I'm not being given f, I'm going to choose f. I'm going to choose p and q in such a way that the difference between the partial of q with respect to x and the partial of p with respect to y equals 1, then I would have the double integral of 1 over the region D, and that would give me the area of the uh, region. And from Green's theorem, I could calculate that by uh, calculating the line integral around the boundary of that particular chosen F. So how could I choose F in order to make this difference in partials equal to 1? Well, one way I could choose it is I could just say, let p be 0 and q equal x. Then the partial of q with respect to x is 1. Partial of p with respect to y would be 0. And so I would get 1 minus 0 is 1. And so I could just calculate it as being the line integral then uh, along the boundary of the region of x dy with that choice of p and q. Another way I might want to do it is to be is to take p to be negative y and q to be 0. That way the partial with q with respect to x is 0. The partial of p with respect to y would be negative 1. So I'd have 0 minus a negative 1 which equals 1. And in that case, my integrand for the line integral would just be the opposite of y dx. So calculating that line integral around the boundary of the region would also give me the area of the region. And finally, maybe I could balance it between the two. I could take q to be half x, p to be negative half y, so the partial of q with respect to x would be 1 half. The partial of p with respect to y would be negative 1 half. And so my integrand would be 1 half minus a negative 1 half, which is the same as 1. And in that case, I would take the line integral over the boundary of x dy minus y dx and multiply that by a half. Now, which one am I going to choose? Many times it does not matter. Uh, usually one of the first two is going to be simpler. It really depends on the problem. So let's look at some examples. In this first example, we're going to look find the area under one arch of the cycloid. And the cycloid is defined using the parametric equations x equals t minus sine of t and y equals 1 minus cosine of t. And so here is what it looks like. Remember the cycloid is generated by imagining that you have a circle rolling along the x-axis and if you keep a point on the circumference of the circle fixed it traces out the cycloid as the circle rolls along the x-axis. So we're trying to calculate the region under this one arch. 
So its boundary is going to have two parts. It's going to have the actual curve and then this line segment. And remember for Green's theorem, we have to go around the boundary in a counterclockwise direction, or more specifically, we have to walk around the boundary, keeping the region R to the left. All right, so we have three choices for P and Q here, which should give me the same answer. If I look at R prime, uh, it's going to turn out, I think, that the simplest choice is going to be uh, f being negative y comma zero. That is, we're going to choose p to be negative y and q equal to zero. And if I look at f of r of t, I'll see that I have now in my uh, first component slot, I have cosine of t minus 1, which is the opposite of y, and 0 in my second slot. If I had used p equals 0 and q equals x, I'd have a 0 in the first slot, which looks attractive. I would be dotting that with 1 minus sine t. But then the second slot, I would have x, which is a t minus sine of t. When you form that dot product, you'll wind up having to use integration by parts. So I'm going to use uh, this choice for P and Q to avoid integration by parts. So when I form the dot product, I do get four terms, which might look intimidating. But when I actually look at the integral, when I form the, find the antiderivative, my bounds go from 0 to 2 pi. So any antiderivative which is based on sine or cosine will evaluate to 0, because the upper bound and the lower bound uh, is going to give me the same value uh, for any sine or cosine function. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine, but sine of 0 is the same as sine of 2 pi. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, but negative cosine of 2 pi is the same as the negative cosine of 0. So that will contribute nothing to the value of the integral. And this term right here, sine of t, cosine of t, can make a u sub, and this will evaluate to 1 half sine squared t. But again, sine squared of 2 pi is the same as sine squared of 0. So the only term of the four that make any contribution is negative 1. And its antiderivative then would be negative t. Negative t evaluated between 0 and 2 pi gives me negative 2 pi. And again, I my given parameterization has t increasing from 0 to 2 pi. So that is not the parameterization for c. It's the parameterization for the opposite of c1 here. And so I really want the uh, value of the line integral over c1. Uh, and that's very simple. All I do is change the sign here from negative to positive. What about along the line segment? Well, you have a lot of choices with line segments. I think this one will use the most obvious parameterization. We'll have x equal to t and y equals 0. t goes from 0 to 2 pi. So our prime is just uh, 1 comma 0. And f of r of t winds up being, well, remember that we, we were using f equals negative y comma 0. Well, here in this case, y equals 0. The second slot is already 0. So in this case, f of r of t is the 0 vector. So the uh, line integral along c2 is also going to be 0. So if I combine the two, I'll get the line integral over the entire boundary c, which equals 2 pi. And that will be my area using Green's theorem. Let's look at another example. We're going to try to find the area of the region enclosed by these 
two curves. So a line and an x equals one fourth y squared parabola. Now, we don't need to use Green's theorem uh, in order to, to calculate this area. And in fact, we didn't need to use Green's theorem to calculate the area in the previous example. But it might just be an alternative way to do it, or it may be simpler. In example one, it probably was simpler. Uh, in, ex in this example, we could just as easily use our techniques from first semester calculus. And in fact, we will do that to check our answer. But let's go ahead and use Green's theorem. Again, we have really three formulas that we could use depending upon our choice of P and Q. In this one, I'm going to use X, D, Y. So for the line segment, that's my curve C1, I can parameterize it by using x equals x and y equals 2x minus 4. In that case, then I would need to use, find my differential dy, dy, then taking differentials of both sides of y equals 2x minus 4, I'll have dy equals 2 dx. And uh, what do I know about x? Well, again, the, the these two curves meet at the point, uh, well, 4 comma 4 at the top here. And this is 1 comma negative 2. So x has to go from 1 to 4. Now C2 goes in a way that where uh, y is actually uh, decreasing and x is also decreasing, at least throughout part of it. We're actually going to parameterize. Uh, it's easy to parameterize this since I have x equals 1 fourth y squared. So y would be our parameter. We'd like our parameter to be increasing. So instead of parameterizing C2, we'll parameterize the opposite of C2, as we've done in the past. And so then, uh, in this case, because y is my parameter, uh, I don't need to worry about uh, the differential dy. dy will be dy. So let's go ahead and calculate this line integral. I'd break it up into two parts. But since my parameterization is over the opposite of C2, I'll change the uh, curve on the second integral to opposite of C2 and then change this plus sign to a minus sign. So using our parameterization for the first integral, my bounds go from 1 to 4. The integrand then is x and dy is what we calculated as 2x. In the second line integral, y is my parameter. And so dy just stays dy, but I have to change the integrand x and substitute x equals 1 fourth y squared. And my bounds of integration then have to be bounds on my parameter y. So they'll go from negative 2 to positive 4. So evaluate those. Take the antiderivative first and evaluate them. And it turns out to be uh, a nice integer nine. If we want to check our answer, we can go back to our calc one methods. So we would just take the equation for the right curve and subtract the equation from the left curve. Uh, I'd have to solve y equals 2x minus 4 for x. When I do that, I find that x equals 1 half y minus 2. So this would be the line minus the parabola, right curve minus left curve. So it's a fairly simple antiderivative, and evaluation gives me the same value of 9. Now, it's worth noting that uh, if you were to change the parameterization for uh, C2 here, oh, I'm sorry, C1, my mistake. I'm going to change that to be parameterized by y. 
instead of x. So then uh, y would be my parameter. x would be 1 half y minus 2. And then y would uh, increase from negative 2 to positive 4. Then what would x dy be? Well, in the, I would keep dy as dy. That's my parameter. x would be 1 half y minus 2. And when I combine those as a single integral, it's exactly the same integral that I would get using my Calc 1 technique. So there's more than one way to, to calculate these uh, integrals. And it makes sense that ultimately they are all equivalent to each other.